All right, I want to talk to you today, kind of a lengthy study coming up here, about three types of Christians. I'm going to use our chalkboard here because I have a lot of things I need to uh, write out and everything. And I apologize for the glare on my glasses. We have windows here and I have lighting set up, I'm trying to take away some of the shadowing here. Still got some work to do to uh, get all the lighting worked out in this room. But um, I just I want to do a detailed study on this because this thing has been plaguing me and plaguing me uh, now for years and years and years. More people are coming out all the time uh, accusing me of teaching a false gospel and I'm not really saved and all this other stuff. I mean, it's so idiotic. I mean, all the things that the Lord has done for us and, and done through this ministry, people's lives that have been changed, and it's all been fake. You know, see... Satan and his ministers of Satan are attacking on a couple different fronts right now, okay? Number one, they attack through the rapture issue. Uh, why? Because the rapture issue is extremely important. They'll tell you it's not. Uh, it's very important, extremely important. I mean, I had a brother write to me a little bit ago here, and, and uh, it was so good what he was saying. He believes that the strong delusion is the rapture. God shall send them strong delusion. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 talks about that. God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. And we don't, we don't often think about how bad the time of Jacob's trouble is going to be when the body of Christ is removed. Um, they receive not the love of the truth. That's why God send them, uh, sends them a strong delusion. All right? And that rapture, when it happens, it's going to usher in the Antichrist. And I believe that people are going to believe that he's Jesus Christ. But the strong delusion... I will change my stand. Say, I'm not too prideful to change my stand. I've always taught the strong delusion is the Antichrist, but I think it starts with the rapture. And I'll talk more about that in a future study because it's, you know, there's some detail to it there. But, you know, the fact of the matter is, if the Antichrist showed up while the body of Christ is on the earth, every Christian out there would be saying, that guy's the Antichrist. Look at that. But what happens when all the truly saved leave? And you're left with a lot of false converts and they're all lost people. All the people that are left after the rapture, they're all lost. It's going to be amazing. So the, the devil and his little Jesuits, or whatever you want to call them, ministers of Satan, um, those people are attacking the rapture, the pre-time of Jacob's trouble, catching away, if you want the Bible term. They're attacking that. And they're also attacking true salvation, which includes repentance. And what they're doing is they're saying, Lordship salvation. Now, I personally have talked about this thing called Lordship Salvation, but from now on, that term is going to be gone from my mouth. Lord willing. Hopefully, I won't forget myself and bring it up again. Uh, why? It is not found anywhere in the pages of the King James Bible. So what happens is, I define Lordship Salvation, I always have, as people saying you have to clean up your life before you get saved, and then God grants you repentance, kind of like the hyper-Calvinists would do. Um, that's what I was taught uh, from uh, Ruckman and some others that I studied under, and they would teach this thing of Lordship Salvation, and but then there's other people that will teach it slightly differently, and this and that, and, and there's so much variation within this teaching of Lordship Salvation um, God's not the author of confusion. Now, if you could turn to me a, in, in the King James Bible and show me a verse that says, Lordship salvation, or clearly defines it, but nobody can ever give me a verse that clearly defines Lordship salvation. It's not in there. So why as Bible, Bible believers are we using this term to attack? See? The devil came in and sowed this to, to sow discord among the brethren. And I'll grant you, there are some people that I think are lost and accusing me of preaching uh, Lordship Salvation. And I'm going to show you that in this study. But I think that there are some saved brethren that have also been led astray with this Lordship Salvation thing. And they have, you know, been taken into confusion, quite frankly. But uh, we're going to talk about three types of Christians today. And I've used the term... Christians lately. I put the term Christians in quotations there. All right. Why? Because there's only one uh, group within these three that's actually saved. All right. First of all, you have people that have, they say, belief only. Only believe. Only believe. Believe and receive. Right there. Belief only. Then you have people that have faith and repentance. All right. Then you have works. People that believe that they can do good works to earn heaven. 
Let me put a line in here to separate these because there certainly is a line of separation between these three groups. They're not the same. Okay. Now there's a lot of different ways that we can define this, uh, these three different groups here. And I don't really have any sermon notes because quite frankly, this we're gonna just be going through a lot of scriptures. And if I have to come back and redo things and whatever else, I'm gonna do that. Um, but we're gonna look at some scriptures. Okay, first of all, we're gonna look at this one. This is the true salvation right here in the middle. All right, this is false, this is false. And I know some of you are going to be too thin-skinned and too uh, hypocritical to actually watch the entire study and consider the arguments and the scriptures used here. I know some of you are already writing the comments. You're already done with the video. Why would that be? Well, I know why. And I'm seeing it more and more and more. So I'm just going to read the verses to you here. It's just so frustrating to me. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2, Preach the word, be instant, in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all longsuffering and doctrine. That's what I'm doing right now. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers, having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned unto fables. All right? That's exactly what a lot of people are doing. And again, I'll be getting into that as... as we go through this thing. I see this all the time. People commenting on my videos. I know that they aren't watching the video. I know. What's the problem? They're not enduring sound doctrine. But let's define the true salvation here. I'm going to show you. Acts chapter 20, verse 21. I'll write it in here, Acts 20, verse 21. It says, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, if you want to make that belief, then you have two beliefs there. Those are two different things, but part of the same event. All right. When you come to God, you come to Him as a broken sinner. That's the way the thing works. Any Christian that has ever gotten saved, that has been born again, came to the Lord in a broken state. You cannot be fixed until you know you are broken. All right. Let me show you another verse on this. And we're going to be talking more about this. We're going to be talking more in detail and everything. Um... Look up for me the verse that says about, uh, I'm not coming to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And my wife helped me with some of the verses. A lot of verses, I know the verse very well, but it's just, the scripture references elude me sometimes, especially when I'm trying to put together a study. But you see there, while she's looking that up, um, they that are whole have no need of the physician, but they that are sick. Well, there's actually three verses that say almost that word for word. Three different passages, yeah. But which, just give me one of them. Okay, Luke chapter 5, verse 32. Okay, all right, let me, let me do it this way. I'll write it down here. Luke chapter 5, uh, verses 31 through 32. Okay. And Jesus answering said unto them, They that are whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Okay, and there are other passages that talk about the same thing. Now, I want you to think about that. Because, see, this is true salvation. True salvation is somebody says, I'm sick, I need to be cured. And don't tell me, oh, well, you know, people, the, the lost world can't understand that they're sick. They can't understand that they're sinners. That's another thing that you'll get from this crowd over here, the belief-only people. Why does it say over in Galatians then about how that the laws are schoolmaster to bring us to Christ? God's Ten Commandments are written into our hearts. So don't give me this nonsense that sinners cannot understand that they're sinners. That's not true. That is a lie. 
okay? Uh, definitely a lie. And I'm going to show you later on that sinners can even act righteously here and here without having true salvation. Oh, absolutely. But let's just say it this way. What happens when you get sick? Well, most people, I mean, some people run off to the doctor right away, which you shouldn't do. But uh, most people will try to get over their sickness. But what happens when that sickness gets worse and worse and worse and everything that you've tried has failed? What do you do? You go to the hospital. You call the doctor. Why? You can't cure yourself. You've tried everything. Nothing works. And finally, you're in a broken state. You're like, I'm far worse than I was two weeks ago. If I don't do something soon, I'm going to die. I mean, this is like really, really bad. I barely have any strength anymore and whatever else. And you come to the doctor and the doctor says, yes, you definitely are sick. Thank you. Come again. You'd say, whoa, okay. <laughs> I know I'm sick. Um, what's the cure? So why would you come to Jesus Christ? You know, these, these people over here will say, well, you know, just come to Jesus and, and yes, we're all sinners. We know that we're all sinners and just believe that Jesus died for your sins and that's it. You can just go on about your life. No, because you see, when you come to Jesus Christ broken, you know, they that are sick, they need the physician, repentance towards God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Do you understand? When you come to the Lord broken, you want a cure for that. Now, does that mean that once you get cured of the doctor, that you never, you get come to him for, with a cold and you get cured of the cold, that you never ever get a cold again? No, it doesn't mean that. It doesn't mean that. But now you know where to go to get the cure. You see? You see how that thing works? And I'm not saying that you have to be re-saved or something like that, okay? I mean, some of these heretics out there that have been attacking me, it's just ridiculous. I'm going to be exposing them by name, by the way. So stay tuned for that. But the fact of the matter is, when you come to the Lord for salvation, you have to understand that you are a sinner. That's why you come to Him for the cure. All right? It isn't just, oh, well, you know, yes, we're all technically sinners. And so, you know, I'll just uh, say that I believe in Jesus up here and I won't have any kind of a changed life. You're sick. You want a changed life. You see? And until you're in that broken state where you're saying, God, please give me the cure. I mean, look at the people that Jesus Christ is, is, is meeting with there. You know, um, publicans. There was a great company of publicans and of others that sat down with them. You read in other passages, it's harlots and things like this. Why were they there? Because they wanted to believe in Jesus and continue doing what they were doing? No. They wanted a different life. They wanted a changed life. Oh, so then when they got cured of their sin by believing in Jesus Christ, then they never sinned again. No, 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 no. See, people are trying to put that on me, and it really ticks me off. It ticks me off that people are saying, I'm here preaching Lordship salvation, and that you have to have a sinless life afterwards. I have never preached that, okay? These people that are preaching that are liars, absolute total liars. I have never once said that a Christian will have a sinless life. Never once. I mean, I talk about sin all the time. I talk about messing up. I talk about, you know, pornography addictions and, and problems with gluttony and, and cigarettes and alcohol and whatever. I talk about sins and how that Christians struggle with those sins. So these people that are trying to say that I teach sinless perfection after salvation, they are ministers of Satan. I've never taught that. Never. And people say, I've seen other comments and things which... We'll be showing them later. Uh, people say, well, you know, I used to listen to Brother Brian, but it's sad to see that he's gone off the deep end. I've always preached the same thing when it comes to the gospel. I've never preached anything different. I've always preached faith in Jesus Christ and repentance toward God. Coming to God as a sinner. That's why when we say you need to repent of your sins, that doesn't mean that you turn from all your sins to get saved. What it means is your attitude, your self-righteous attitude needs to change towards your sins. And by the way, this group over here, the belief only and the works people, that's why they reject this. Because they don't want to give up their sins. They are self-righteous and prideful and they cannot stand the thought of having to give up sin. 
And again, you know, I'm not saying give up sin to be saved. Here I'm saying give up sin because you are saved and because you are continuing. You know, to see, see, I gotta, I gotta be so careful how I say anything anymore because it's just like these people watch my videos. You know, I'm actually watching this one false prophet, and he's just like watching, and I see him mouthing the words as I'm speaking, like he's watched it over and over and over and rehearsed what he's gonna say. I mean, they're just hanging on every single little thing I say. <laughs> okay, I'm not saying that you have to continue sinless. Okay, please understand my mouth doesn't always work all that well. What I'm saying is when you come to Jesus Christ, faith, and you put your faith in Him because you're a sinner, you cannot save yourself, you're there for the cure, you understand that sin has hurt you in the past and you want something to be done about that. So you say, I'm here as a sinner, please save me and help me to get out of this life of sin. You can fall back into the life of sin, you can get really, really, really messed up, you can apostatize from the Lord, fall away from the Lord, in other words, you can do those things and still remain saved. All right? But what happens over here, the belief-only people and the works people, they both, both do the same thing. They create false religion, a false profession, and so that they can say, I'm a good person and I'm not that bad and whatever else. Oh, yes, general truth, we all are sinners, blah, blah, blah. And they'll just go on and live like the devil. They don't want to give up certain sins. All right? Not give them up to, to be saved. Okay, get that through your thick skulls out there, you, those of you who accuse me of lordship salvation. I'm not saying you have to give up sins to be saved. Do you understand that? Reverse the video and play it a couple times until it gets through that thick skull of yours, okay? I, I can't seem to get it through some of these people's minds. Maybe there's too many devils in there or something like that and it can't get through. I don't understand. Okay, you do not have to give up sins to be saved. Understand that. You can fall back into sin after being saved. I understand that. All right? But let's continue here. Now, one of the big verses that these people over here will use, they'll say, what about the jailer? Acts chapter 16 Okay, Acts chapter 16, verses 30 through 31. Okay, it says here, And brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. And they say, See, Belief is only mentioned, and there's no repentance involved. All right? Now, I did a whole study on this thing, the, the doctrine of easy believism, and they say because it doesn't say repentance, that means repentance does have no place of salvation. All he was told to do is believe. Uh, yes, but what was it going to cost the guy? What was going to happen to him after he had done this thing? You read in another part of the book of Acts where the, the, you know, they escape the jail, basically, and the keepers of the jail are put to death because you know, the Christians escaped. So what was going to happen to this uh, jail keeper here? He knew what it meant. I mean, he lets two guys out of prison. Why would he do a thing like that? Why? Because he came to them broken. Somebody comes to you broken, you don't have to, to say, or, or, or have, you, have you, you repented enough, you know? Are, are you really repentant here? You don't need to do that, okay? So that's why repentance is not mentioned in the passage, because the guy's in a broken state. Isn't that fairly obvious? But see, what these heretics over here will want you to believe is, they want you to believe that anyone who says, I believe in Jesus, I put my faith in Jesus, that you should never inspect their fruit. You'll hear that from these liars. They'll say, don't ever inspect their fruit. You should never inspect the fruit of a, of a person that says that they're saved because you can be saved and just live like a total, complete Satanist. You know, it's like these, these satanic witches over here at this Babel building, this fool gospel Babel building, and they come out and they say, we got saved back in the 1970s and we... Uh, just kind of carried our music along the whole time, and, and we love the secular music, this music that's openly satanic, you know. I mean, 
you know, ACDC, let's sing their songs when they got an album that says called Highway to Hell and, and you know, they're they're openly worshiping the devil. I mean, you can go to Terry Watkins, you know, av1611.org, read the articles. It's very vexing where these guys are openly saying, yeah, we worship Satan. They're satanic. And you get these people that say, well, we're Christians. See, because, uh, because we have belief. Um, but where's the repentance? I mean, these guys... You know, long hair, tattooed, just vile people. But they believe. So according to some of you uh, hypocrites out there, um, because I preach this, faith and a changed life, faith and repentance, you know, because I preach this, I'm lost, but these guys are saved. And uh, who's got a false system of belief again? I'm going to tell you, it's not me. It isn't me. I mean, what's the whole purpose of this whole system? This whole system here and this one over here is to eliminate God's condemnations against sin. You can be a Christian and continue in sin. You can be a good person and do lots of good works. And let's go to this one, by the way, too, because I don't have any scriptures over there. It's feeling kind of lonely, so let's go over there. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. People say, because you teach lordship salvation. Brian Denlinger teaches lordship salvation, and therefore I cannot listen nor support his ministry anymore. Okay, yeah. And they say, I'm teaching works to be saved. Let's look about this. The infamous Ephesians 2, verses 8 through Nine. Let's see what the Bible actually condemns in terms of works. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. This type of salvation over here is works, good works, so that a man can boast in his good works. It's works to the exclusion of Jesus Christ. Jesus' death on the cross to a works salvationist is null and void. They don't care what Jesus Christ did on the cross because they're working their way to heaven. Okay? They exclude the cross other than just an empty belief in it. But this is why these people, they deny eternal security. Let me write that. Okay? They're always so careful. I always got to do things right and always, I just, oh, you know. Give you a good example. Catholics and Amish. Perfect example of this over here. Continuously doing good works. And when they fall, when they get messed up, they don't come back to the cross. They come back to doing good works. They'll do penance. Confession and then penance. That's what they'll do continuously doing good works. You say, well, that's the same thing that you believe over here. Oh, no, not at all. I don't have to go back to Jesus Christ and I don't have to continue doing good works to stay saved. I know that I'm eternally secure. All right? And again, the hypocrites are going to be out there and say, oh, yes, but you say that there's two possible exceptions. I'm saying that there are two things in the Bible that I can't explain. I'm honest. All right? I'm very honest. I mean, when I look and I see Romans chapter 11 and I see Revelation chapter 22 and also early part of the book of Revelation talks about I will not blot out his name out of the book of life. And I look at that and I say, I don't know what to do with that. I'm not going to force it into eternal security and twist the verse and say, well, no, this is actually teaching eternal security. Now, Romans chapter 11 could be, and we've had, I've had many good discussions with brethren over this, Romans 11 could be national you know, God putting curses on a nation because they go against the Jews. That's a possibility, although it says thee, thou, you know, singular personal pronoun there. I don't know. Uh, Revelation chapter 22, you could say, well, that's for people in the millennial kingdom. But then what do you do with the early part of the book of Revelation? You say, well, that could be instead of the church age, it could be the time of Jacob's trouble. The whole point is not many Christians are going to mess around with, with, uh, attacking the Jewish people, the nation of Israel. And I don't know too many Christians that actually want to rewrite the Bible 
for themselves and add to and subtract from it and call it God's holy word. So I'm not really worried about either one of those. But um, I find it ironic, and I've said this many, many times, and, and that is that I can spend an hour and a half defending eternal security, and I say there are two verses I can't explain, and people go, he teaches against eternal security. What? <laughs> Excuse me? I've, I have multiple sermons defending eternal security. There's two passages I say, I don't know. And I've never heard a good explanation of what they really mean, somehow proving eternal security. I mean, it's, it's, it's absolutely ridiculous. But my belief is when you come to the Lord, you get saved, your life will bear some fruit. There will be some proof of a conversion. I mean, what happened to the Apostle Paul? Paul's supposed to be our example. Uh, did he have a changed life after he got saved? Yes, absolutely. He sure did. All right. You can't say, well, no, he just continued. You know, he was a, a Pharisee and he was going out persecuting Christians and he got saved and he just kind of kept doing the same thing. No, there was a changed life. And, but yet you see the struggle with Paul. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. See? Faith is what Jesus Christ does for you. Repentance is what you do for the Lord. All right? God tells you what to do. You are bought with a price. And again, people get all excited about that. Oh, yes, well, sure, we're bought with a price, but we can still sin and things. I know that. I know that. You know? And I, I'm just going to go ahead and kick this individual here because I have him up on my computer screen over here. Uh, Edward Fenninger. Edward PF123. Okay? You want to talk about a useless ministry? Um, this guy here... I saw problems with him from very, very early on, and I've always had a bit more grace than some of the brethren. I don't try to expose some guy. I mean, he's, you know, he's like defending the King James Bible and stuff, and he's, he's coming out with some, you know, videos, and I'm like, well, you know, oh, okay, all right. Eh. But it's always this thing of this leaning this way. In fact, not so much leaning, but overall in this way. And, um, he came out with a video just a couple days ago openly saying, Brian Denlinger is preaching Lordship Salvation. And again, there's no definition from Scripture on this thing. I can define Lordship Salvation one way. He can define it his way according to what he wants to try and prove. And its whole video is a lie. It's saying that I say that once you get saved, you can never fall away. You can never sin again. I've never taught that. He's a liar, an absolute total liar. And, you know, I'm just going to kind of go through down, down through some of the names here. Um, some of the people, uh, Bible Berean 1611, Jay Downer, uh, agrees with him here. Amen and amen, brother. I uh, thought you were a friend. Now you're calling me a false prophet. Okay. King James Warrior, Starks, Teal, KJB 1611. Pandaman Evangelist, Stephen Pham, KJB 1611, Robert Arbogast, Benjamin Joseph, Bread of Life, Half Step 67, Talking for Truth. Talking for Truth. His name's Alex. He lives up in Canada. And uh, this guy, he go, he went over to the Anders Snake camp years and years ago. And I was like, hey, man, you know, get away from that. Oh, you don't know what you're talking about. Bye-bye. Just get away from my ministry. I don't need you. Okay? Just irritates me. A bunch of stinking liars is what you are. Uh... Next, we have Bible videos, Michael Morales, Jesus Saves, H-C-H-A-V-E-S-27, and Rain 1611. Okay, that's all the people that watch the videos. Barely anybody even watches this Edward Fenninger guy. But he just comes out with just lies and lies and lies. And it's ironic because in the video, he actually says that um, all you have to do, there's no prayer involved. There's not even any prayer involved in salvation. All you do is you just thank God for, you know, if you want to pray, thank God for saving you. You know, uh, and it's ironic because um, he started saying this heresy of his uh, that you don't even need to pray to be saved. Um, and I don't say that there's a, an actual prescribed prayer that you must pray this in order to be saved. No, I don't say that. You just call upon the name of the Lord and you get saved. God offers salvation. You go to him and you say, you know, God, please save me doesn't really matter how you say it. You're just trying to 
establish that personal relationship with him. But ironic that Edward Fenninger came out with that heresy right after Martin Richling was coming around making all his stink. And he actually came out and said, I believe Martin Richling. And it was at that point I was like, okay, see ya. And I know a lot of other brethren did too. And Ed, you know, he kind of took his video, well, I, I shouldn't have maybe said that, you know, that Richling was this or that and stuff like this. You know what I think it is? I think Richling and Ed Fenninger are part of the same group. Maybe uh, military spooks or Jesuits or I have no idea. The guy's been false for years, years and years and years. And I just kind of say, hey, hands off, you know, Lord will deal with him and stuff like this. See, that's the way I do things. All right. If you're false, God will deal with you. Okay. If I'm false, God will deal with me. And yet the ministry continues to grow. And don't give me this nonsense. Now, supposing the gain is godliness. That's talking about money in 1 Timothy chapter 6. It's not talking about God blessing and using somebody. This ministry is used. God is using this ministry to reach hundreds of thousands of people. And yet these other little, just little nasally, just, hey, you, say, you just want to watch the video and I'm just going to, you know, and Ed's just watching my video and just lip syncing along with me. Just like he's there practicing what he's going to say to attack me. Get over it, man. Get a life. I mean, good night. If God isn't using you, maybe you ought to figure out why. <laughs> but getting back to what I'm saying, to just simply say there's just belief only, there's no prayer, there's no nothing, there's no changed life, there's no repentance that uh, happens, you know, there's no coming to God as a broken sinner. You just say, just I now am believing that Jesus died for my sins. I'm not even going to bother calling on the Lord. I'll just say, oh, hey, thank you for saving me. And then they go on living like the devil. Okay? And again, you know, a lot of these guys, you know, a lot of these guys, I'm kind of getting ahead of myself here, but they'll get very, very philosophical with this thing. And they'll say, yes, but, but what about the, the guy in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 that had his father's wife? And, you know, what, I mean, a, a Christian could... In type, you know, when the Bible says that every knee shall bow, it says shall, not must. And, and so they're, they get real philosophical. And, you know, maybe you ought to be uh, concerned about what the Bible says about philosophy. Let me show you. Colossians chapter 2. I'm going to put this over here. Colossians. Two, verse 8. The Bible says, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. You see, a lot of the brethren that are here that have, that have had saving faith and a changed life after salvation, after salvation, did you get that hypocrite? Did you get it? Did you get it? I didn't say before. Okay? After salvation salvation, a changed life, when they put their faith in Jesus Christ, a lot of them will get real philosophical. They'll come over and they'll listen to these heretics over here and they'll say, oh, I'll listen to this philosophy right there. And then they start to attack. They'll go against true biblical salvation. Why? Because they have been spoiled through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. And I know Dr. Ruckman has a very good sermon on the rudiments of the world. I'll list them for you as he lists them, and I think he's right on this. Number one, these are the rudiments that the world will use to get you to sin. It goes like this. Number one, everybody else does it. Did you ever hear that one? Number two, we always have done it. Number three, a little bit doesn't hurt. Number four, my conscience doesn't convict me. These little heretics over here at the full gospel fellowship here. Number five, we know when to quit. Number six, you got to make a living and get married. You know, number seven, it all depends on how you look at it. Music is neutral. It doesn't matter. It's the lyrics that are good. I used to say those same things as a lost heretic. Okay. I was over here for years and years and years. I believed in Jesus, but there was absolutely no coming to God as a broken sinner, my self-righteousness was still there. I didn't truly put my faith in Jesus Christ. Why? Because I wanted to hold on to my sin. I didn't want to give up any kind of sin. And I lived pretty clean too, by the way, as a lost professing Christian heretic. <laughs> a 
Okay, I lived very clean, a lot cleaner than a lot of, you know, people that profess to be saved, you know. Uh, but the point is, this was me over here. And by the way, I held on to uh, heavy metal. I loved heavy metal. And uh, the uh, Christian, you know, Christian heavy metal is what drew me into the secular stuff. And when I say heavy metal, I mean heavy metal, rock and roll, whatever you want to call the garbage. It's all filth. It's all from Satan. Okay, rap music is also satanic. But rock music, heavy metal, rap music, a lot of the country music out there, I loved it. And I didn't want to give it up. But I believe in Jesus. That's why you have a lot of these guys like Elvis and, and Johnny Cash and a lot of these, you know, Alan Jackson and stuff like this, and they'll say, I believe in Jesus. And they'll sing gospel albums. And then they turn right around and sing albums about fornication and adultery and drunkenness and use profanity and whatever else. They're Christians, though, because they believe. You see? You see how that thing works? No, they see they haven't come to the end of themselves yet. There's no desire there to live for Jesus Christ. And that's, you know, we got a question here recently about, um, and we get this question a lot, and that is you get these relatives and they say, I'm a Christian. They believe, you know, I'm a Christian, and, uh, but just don't talk to me about the Bible. They don't like to talk about the Bible. The, they don't like to, uh, you know, not watch television. They, all the standards that a Bible believer's Christian, Bible believing Christian is supposed to have, they reject almost all of them. And they do it for 20, 30 years. Years and years and years and years and years and years and years. It isn't, well, I was really on fire for the Lord and I kind of fell away and I got kind of mixed up and stuff. You know, I stopped the process of repentance. And this is a continuing process, by the way. As I said, this is what the Lord did for you. This is what you do for the Lord. Okay? You're continually repenting. As the Lord shows you new truth, as the Lord convicts you through His Holy Spirit, through His Word, you say, oh boy, I better give that thing up. And if you don't, well, then there's a sin unto death. Okay? And again, Ed Fakinger over here, he's like, oh, he doesn't believe in that. Brian Ellinger doesn't believe in that. You're a stinking liar. You are a liar. I have taught about the sin unto death. You know, I have, a, I have an FAQ video on the thing. I mean, give me a break. You know, he doesn't believe in that. You liar, you. And the Holy Spirit's in Ed Fakinger. Fenninger, excuse me. And you, and let me, let me tell you something, you hypocrites, if, if you start, you know, there's, there's people I'm losing a lot of grace for because I've explained this thing over and over and over again. If people come on and they're militantly post-trib and they're just, oh, you're, you're lying, you're lying, you're lying, whoop, blocked, you're off my channel. See, I'm not about numbers. Okay. I really don't care. God uses the ministry. God blesses the ministry, but I don't need people to continue. You know, I want big inflated numbers. I'm going to block all kinds of people doesn't matter to me. And you hypocrites out there that one minute, oh, Brother Brian, I'm so blessed by you. And the next minute you go and you listen to a liar like Ed Fenninger. And then you come out and you say, oh, well, you know, Brother Brian, yeah, he's, he's a little bit messed up and stuff. You know, this one guy, Craig McKenzie was his name. And he comes out and he says, uh, writing back and forth with me and things, he says, you teach Lordship Salvation. And I said, okay, could you please give me a definition from Scripture? And I said, so according to you, salvation would be that I have to have faith in Jesus, believe in Jesus, and never teach what you call Lordship Salvation, and then I could be saved. Because he was saying I was lost. He was saying I'm a lost, false prophet preaching a false gospel. That's what this guy was teaching. Or that's what he was saying, you know, in his comment. I don't have time for that. I really do not have time for that. I have explained this thing over and over and over again, and by God's grace, this is going to be the last time I explain it. And if you don't like it, get off my channel. If you don't, I'm going to force you off my channel. And you hypocrites out there that one minute you're my friend and the next minute you're stabbing me in the back on some other stinking channel with a reprobate like Ed Fenninger, I'm getting rid of you too. You know, I consider Jay Downer to be a friend, a good friend for many, many years, and then I see him stabbing me in the back. You need to check yourself, brother. You really do. But let's get back to it here. You know, this is not, not going to be a real organized sermon or anything else. But, you know, getting back to what I was saying, you have these people that they say, I'm saved, you know, over here. But yet, they hate the truth. And it's a life long. It's years and years and years and years and years. It's not that they were here and then they went over to here. No, 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 no. 
it's a lifelong years and years and years and years of sin. Okay, give you another good example. Jack Hiles. Jack Hiles, I have a very big issue with the guy because he was fake. And he preached this and preached against this. That's one of the ways that you can tell these people are fake. When they're preaching here and attacking this. All right. That's very, very dangerous. And, you know, if somebody's newly saved and they get they're here and they get pulled over to there and they start coming this way. Well, you know, again, I'm going to have a little bit of grace for them. I mean, it, all this stuff, brethren, it's just like it's insane. I mean, we are truly in the great falling away. You know, Christians, no Christian years ago, you know, truly saved Christian, I should say, no truly saved Christian years ago would have argued with me on these things. Uh, they were all believers here. OK, um, they talked about it. They say you, he got religion. You know what that meant? That meant there was a big change in his life. All right. Uh, again, I've talked about that in other studies. Peter Cartwright. Uh, he was a very rough young man and, and uh, had a race horse and he played cards and all kinds of other stuff. And I mean, he just like agonized over salvation. And when he got saved, his whole life changed. And he lived for the Lord from then on. I'm not saying he didn't sin. Of course, any Christian sins. You know, I mean, I've never, again, I've never preached sinless perfection after salvation. I've preached against it. I have whole studies against it. And yet some of these satanic heretics like Ed Fenninger and some of these other people that always accuse me of this fake lordship salvation, whatever that thing is, you know, these guys will try to say that I teach sinless perfection somehow. I've never taught that. They're liars. It's just disgusting. But getting back to what we're saying here, let me get another scripture here on the works side just to show you. Titus Titus chapter 3 verse 5 another classic scripture debunking the thing of you can work your way to heaven. Titus 3 5 says not by works of righteousness which we have done but according to his mercy he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. Okay, so again, you cannot say, I can work my way to heaven by excluding the cross. Again, why would you try to work your way to heaven and have faith in Jesus? Doesn't make any sense. And I've talked to this, you know, I've talked to this Amish guy here locally. Jonas Yoder was his name. And I talked to him and it was like, oh, I believe in Jesus. I have faith in Jesus. And it's like, oh, well, what happens if you sin? Well, then I would fall away. And they'll try to quote over in Hebrews and stuff like this, you know, and, which is for the time of Jacob's trouble. Again, you know, some of these some group over here, they'll argue about that, but they got enough problems to deal with. But uh, and I said, so then uh, what do you need to do to get back with God? Do you have to have faith in Jesus again? No, no, I just have to, you know, do the appropriate works and things like this and stuff. And I said, that's Catholicism. He didn't agree with that. <laughs> I didn't figure he would. But you see, that's what's going on over on this side. It works to the exclusion of the cross. See? Over here you say, I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. That good thing that I would do, I do not. The evil thing that I shouldn't do, that's what I do. Romans chapter 7. See? That's why there's a continual process of repentance. And I've seen Christians that are in this group right here, the truly saved Christians, and they will mess up, terribly mess up. I mean, bust their families up, they commit adultery, there's, there's all kinds of problems. Uh, I, you know, like I said, I've met people personally that have done this. They really, really make a serious mistake, and that sin is with them until the time that they die. But I'll tell you what, they'll still be used of the Lord. God will still come in there and use that person, and they can still you know, repent of some of it, even though they can't fix up the damage that they've done, but they'll still, you know, I mean, they, they will, they'll do their very best to serve the Lord. They don't just go back and, and or they don't go and they say, oh, you know, I'm just going to hate God and I'm, I'm an atheist now or something like this. No, no. Again, you know, you have these people, I've, uh, I got saved when I was a, a child, but uh, now I'm an atheist. No, you didn't get saved. Because you see, when you come to this point here, by the way, when you come to the end of yourself and you put your faith in Jesus Christ, you realize, I can't save myself. I am sick. I need to be cured. 
of my sickness. The cure might not last for the rest of my life, but I need a cure for this sickness that I have. I need to know that there's a doctor there that can cure me. When you come to this point, you don't go back. Why? You can't go back. There's nobody else to go to. You've tried everything else. You're saying, I've reached the end of my self-righteousness. My self-righteous pride died. I've repented. I've turned from that self-righteousness. I know I'm not good enough. I know that there's nothing that I can do. So why would you ever go against the Lord after you've come to this point here? You see? You see? Whereas this group over here is continually doing works of righteousness. They're continuing to do good things. They'll be part of churches and do penance and things like this. That's what they want to do. Why? Because they have not crucified that flesh. They have not said, okay, and, and again, you know, people are going to take that and run with it. Oh, you know, he's saying you have to crucify the flesh. Uh, no, you have to come to the place where you realize that you are a sinner. Again, you know, I, I believe in the simplicity of the gospel. And these people out there that are accusing me of lordship salvation, they're, they're just confounding this whole thing. I mean, salvation is simple. Come to God as a sinner. Understand that you are a sinner. Understand, I can't stop the sin. I need a cure. Okay? Simple. Put your faith in Jesus Christ, and God will help you to be a new creature in Christ Jesus. All right? This system over here says, I can continue to do good works and exclude Jesus Christ's death on the cross. Why? Jesus, Christ, Jesus Christ's death on the cross says, you're not good enough. But these heretics over here will say, oh, I, well, I'm not that bad of a person. I'm a good person. I can do good works for people. I can do good things for people. See? They continue to try to work their way to heaven. That's why their salvation is based upon them. That's why they don't believe in eternal security, this group over here. They say, I don't believe in eternal security. Why? Because if I fall away, if I do something bad, then I lose my salvation. That's the whole point. They believe that they are saved to the exclusion of Jesus Christ. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 and Titus 3, 5 is, is condemning this group that believes that they can do works of righteousness to save themselves. Okay? These passages of Scripture are not condemning this group here. Why? We realize no matter how many good works we can do, we can never save ourselves. Right? A true Christian believes that Jesus died for their sins and that the sins that we have committed in our lives, they need to go. And when you get saved, you say, okay, Lord, tell me what I need to get rid of. Again, you know, just, it's insane. This side over here, the people that believe only, these are the ones that are going to get mad at you when you start to witness to them about the truth. Why? They've excluded repentance. All right? They never came to that point where they said, I am no good. They'll say it as a general truth. Oh, well, we're all sinners. You know, we all have a cold. Well, then why don't you take the cure for the cold? Well, no, I don't want the cure for the cold because I kind of like to have the cold. You know, I kind of like the way it makes my voice kind of raspy. I kind of like the, the feeling I get. I kind of like to blow my nose. I, I can get off of work and things like this because I'm sick. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's this type over here. These types of people that say, I believe in Jesus and yet there's no fruit. Let me show you this. And I'm going to tell you, the, the best way to damn somebody to hell is uh, this one right here. Okay, that's the best way to damn somebody to hell. Titus, one, verse 16. Okay, they profess that they know God, believe, but in works they deny him, being abominable and disobedient and unto every good work, reprobate. And of course, people say, well, yes, but it's, verse 14, it's talking about Jewish fables. So it's talking about Jews there. Okay. It's a general truth. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, and righteousness. Okay. What's the general truth that's being taught here? 
the general truth is that there are people, whether Jews or Gentiles or whatever, they will profess that they know God, but they deny him in their works. Again, I've said this before. If I come to you and I say, I am Superman, I can profess that all I want to profess it, but until I can prove to you that I'm Superman, my profession means nothing. Now, what's more powerful, what's more important, Superman or a Christian? I mean, I, I'm a Christian, I'm saved, I'm part of the, the body of Christ, uh, God's Holy Spirit dwells within me, my body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, uh, then uh, why do you still uh, fornicate and do drugs and whatever else and all these other things? Why do you play heavy metal music, rock and roll music, whatever you want to call it? You know, why do you still do that and you have no conviction of conscience? Well, I, to me, I don't really see those things, you know, whatever, see? See, they profess that they know God, but in works they deny Him. That's what I'm talking about. And another verse which I've talked about many, many times, we're going to hit it again, because some people out there just apparently can't get it, and that is 2 Corinthians Kind of weird writing on the chalkboard. Been a long time since I've done this. 517. Knew I was going to go there. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. All right. Now, if is a conditional clause. Now, I've talked about that many, many times. I say, I'm going to give you a million dollars if you come back and ask for it in 100 years from now. Well, see, it's a conditional clause. I say, if. So when the Bible says, therefore, if any man be in Christ. In other words, there are people that can profess that they are in Christ. There are people that can say, I'm in Christ, and that they're not. If a man is in Christ, old, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And it doesn't mean he's cleaned up everything in his life. Again, you know, if you're a younger person out there, I know I, I get uh, a lot of, messages from from young men and even some you know young women and things i've heard of and that is they'll say i'm i'm really you know trying to fight this thing of pornography addiction i'm trying to fight gluttony i'm trying to fight this i'm trying to fight that you know and it's been months and months now and i was okay and now i fell back into it again I, I guess maybe i didn't get saved no 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 i've never taught that again i don't teach that okay what i'm saying is if you are sinning and you have no conviction of conscience about it. Okay, like I mentioned Jack Hiles earlier. Jack Hiles, fornicating with his, you know, deacon's wife, Jenny Nishik. You know, and his, the deacon knew about it. You know, they did a, a news report it was so bad on the thing. And his daughter came out and admitted to it. Jack Hiles' daughter came out and admitted to it. I mean, you know, and, and, and yet they asked him in the news interview, you know, are you doing this? And he was like, no, absolutely not. No conviction of conscience. You know, and you say, well, what if he wasn't? I don't believe for one second that the guy was uh, a saved man. I, I believe he was a liar, total liar. I mean, you look at the, the different things, you know, oh, we just barely get by here with money. And then you see him in a sermon and he's like bragging about how he's just bought millions and millions of dollars worth of things. He was a hypocrite. What did he have? Belief. There was no conversion. He was not born again. He was not a new creature in Christ Jesus. That is what I condemn. Again, I'm not saying that when you come to the Lord over here, that somehow you're going to live perfectly sinless from then on. I'm not saying that. Right? And I've never taught that. I've never taught that a Christian becomes sinlessly perfect. You will struggle with sin. Understand that. You will struggle with sin. Good uh, example of this is over... In the book of Galatians 5, verses 19 through, uh, see how far down we want to go. Yeah, go down to verse 26. Okay? Now, Paul is writing to Christians here. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, 
envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Wait a second. Those things had to be for lost people, right? No. Uh, lost people don't inherit the kingdom of God. All right? There'd be no point in writing that to lost people. Paul is writing to saved people, saved people that can do any of the things mentioned in that passage. Okay? Verse 22, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not be desirous of vainglory, provoking one another, envying one another. So see there, verse 24, they that are Christ have crucified the flesh. That means you never sin again. No, because you read over in Romans chapter 7, Paul saying, you know, I'm, I'm struggling with sin. See? One more time. <laughs> uh, right here. You come to God. You're broken. You say, I'm a sinner. They that are whole have no need of the physician, but they that are sick, I come not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Did you get that? Now, after you get saved, you're going to struggle with sin. You're going to have to learn to crucify the flesh. That's not going to be an immediate thing. That's not going to happen right away. But what will happen is there will be a change. Or else it didn't take. If there's never any change that happens after your conversion and you just go on and there's you just I'm just the same person as I always was. You didn't get saved. You're over here. You have no conviction over the things that God hates. See? But if you get saved and you say, I'm doing good, but all of a sudden I'm falling for some of the things here in the verse, verses 19 through 21. And I'm not doing too good in verses 22 through uh, 26, we'll say. Okay? You're saved. Again, you know, you're going to have struggles with the flesh. I have never once taught that Christians are sinlessly perfect. You know, it just gets tiresome after a while. You know, and, and you know, I know a lot of you understand this. I know a lot of you get this. Uh, a lot of my friends here on YouTube, friends of the ministry, you understand what I'm saying. You, you don't uh, stab me in the back like some of these hypocrites over here that I just read about, you know. And I appreciate you. Um, you know, I'm glad that you understand that you haven't lost your mind like some of the others have. But... For those of you who are young, who are newly saved, who are going, I don't understand. What's the relationship here of a saved person with living in sin and whatever else? You know, when you get saved, you come to the Lord broken. You change at that point. Now you become God's property. You know, and, and again, you know, they'll say that, you know, well, you're not, uh, you have to be, uh, they'll say Lordship salvation is when you say that Jesus is your Lord. Uh, you know, again, this Craig McKenzie wrote this. He said, uh, so are you saying that Jesus has to be your Lord after you get saved? And the answer to that is no. He doesn't have to be your Lord. He is your Lord. <laughs> okay? I mean, you know, again, let me just show you that. I mean, people have this funny notion that uh, you can just get saved and, and you can just live like the devil and, and there's not anything that the Lord can do about that. Because, hey, I, you know, I believed, I was going to say pray to prayer, but Ed Fenninger here, you know, this, this fake liar, you know, he comes out and he says, you don't even have to pray a prayer. You can just believe. Just, <laughs> just start believing that you're saved. Wonderful. You know, and, but let me just give you a verse here. Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10. Some of the most famous passage here on uh, salvation. It says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Let me write that one down. Romans 10, 9 through 10. So right there it says, Confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus. Yes, he does become your Lord. Well, then that means that you, that you never sin again. Oh, you know. Uh, you know, I'm looking forward to the Lord coming back and getting the body of Christ out of here because it's in such rough shape right now. It's just like, 
I get accused of so much stuff. It's just like, you, you're lying about me. I don't say that. I never teach that. You know, when you get saved, he saves you. You will have a changed life because you understand the sins were negative, but it's going to take you a lifetime. And even at the end of your life, you're not going to be sinlessly perfect. Even if you do your very, very best for the Lord and you, and you don't mess up much, you're still going to sin someplace. Why? That's what our body does. That's what your flesh does. Your flesh is prone to sin. Okay? Oh, let's continue here. Let me show you another thing. Uh, just trying to think of some of the points. My wife and I were talking about this last night, and I'm trying to think of some of the points. Um, see if I can find this verse real quick here. Uh, look up the verse for me. Um, uh, uh, comparing themselves among themselves. Okay. Uh, Second Corinthians chapter ten, verse twelve. I guess I'll put that over here on this side. Second. And 12. Okay. It says, For we dare not make ourselves of the number or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves. See? Works of righteousness. But they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. You know what this group here likes to do? The one that's justified by their own righteousness, by their own good works. They like to surround themselves with other people that are as big a hypocrites as they are. This side does the same thing. That's why this side and this side here, I'll do it this way. I'll, I'll even draw you a little picture here. 